welcome to Board Talks. We've got a fabulous discussion. Uh, board Talk topic for you today is data security privacy laws. So it's a bit techy. We're going to uh, make sure we do our best in the, to um, get our fabulous panel guests uh, into some real um, conversations and questions and information that we need around what is data security and how does this apply to us in our governing roles. Board Talks has been designed by our community of not-for-profits. We're into our second year and we've got such a strong community joining us and um, participating in these talks. Uh, it's informal, it's relaxed, and it's an opportunity for you just to ask questions that you want to know. Um, we have, uh, before we meet our guests though, we just have to do a bit of housekeeping, which is we are recording this and all of the our board talk videos are on our website and we share it out post, um, post talk. Uh, and if you can please keep yourself on mute, but please use the chat function. You can ask us questions or any of our panelists um, today. And we just want to do a special thanks and a shout out to our sponsors, Havana Coffee Works as well. So our panel guests get a lovely gift pack from Havana Coffee Works. But before we start, uh, we just want to get to know who's on the call today, um, where you're zooming in from. Uh, I know Tracy that you're going to meet shortly. She's down in Dunedin uh, and we've got um, a panel of guests are all over Aotearoa. So we'd love to hear from you and the not-for-profit. Uh, you might be on a couple, you might be on um, one or two if you'd like to share that. And also if you've got some special plans for this weekend, if you're happy to share, uh, been neat to get to know who's with us today. You can put that in the in the chat um, function. Okay, let's see who we've got online with us. Oh. Someone's got a 35th wedding anniversary. Oh, that's fabulous, Carolyn. Well done. I've had my 20th or so this year, so I'm cracking on. Board Secretary from Zealandia, Eco Century. Oh, awesome. Love the environment, Kopapa. How else have we got? Mike from Waiheke. These fabulous uh, locations that everyone's zooming in from. Environment Hubs Aotearoa, welcome. Bethany, kia ora Bethany. Peak Body for Youth Development. Oh, well, we've got a board talk later this year about youth, so you want to connect with us. Got Chris, wife's birthday weekend. Oh, it's awesome. Ross from Epilepsy New Zealand. Lots of eco eco um warriors out here today. That's awesome. From Blenheim, Wado Blenheim, Kia ora. Rizwana, Kia ora Rizwana. I got to meet you up in Women on Boards in Auckland. Takapuna. I've got some wonderful people here online. I could just keep going. So um, thank you so much. And Felix from Grey Power in Rotorua. So, fantastic um, community that we've got with us. Uh, we're so pleased to bring you board talks. Um, we have fabulous conversations and we just really get into it. So, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel guests today. They're very experienced, um, giving up their time for us. So we've got Anthony McMahon and he's from Target State. So he's actually our second guest that we've had on Board Talks. We've got Chris, good friend uh, on a board that I'm on as well. So neat to have you here. And Tracy Saunders from Aurora Energy. So thank you to our panel panelists today. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna ask you each to Share with us one word that your best friend would describe you as. Ugh, that might get might get some really good insights into who you are. Tracy, shall we uh, <clears throat> shall we kick off with you? <laughs> um, hopefully, that's a. I think I've heard quite a few times diligent. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or, or if it's not actually, but po possibly at work it's a good thing. Uh, kia ora tato, kato, tato. Uh, my name is Tracy Saunders. I'm from Aurora Energy. I work here in Autoporti, Dunedin. Um, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. So beautiful background too you have, Tracy. So yeah, plants. So Chris, would uh, what would your best mate say? Diligent or be not diligent. Um I am gonna say funny, uh, because I think I'm funny, so I think all my best friends will think I'm pretty funny too, uh, hopefully. Um got everyone, or Christopher Wingawa. Uh, Internet New Zealand. Nice to meet everyone. Well, fantastic to have you here today. You've also got a wonderful background, um, fabulous uh, artwork behind you, Chris. So talented um, tamariki. Uh, and over to Anthony. So, Anthony, what do you think your best friend would say? Uh, kia ora koutou. Well, I'd hope he'd call me a Muppet because I would call him one um, as one word as well. So, unfortunately, my friend group that I have, we even uh, as uh, the older we've got, the more we've given each other stick. Um, and it's probably what's helped us get through uh, a lot. So I hope he'd say Muppet because it's what I'd say about him. Uh, kia ora everyone, I am Anthony, um, I'm based in Auckland, based out in Huapai, um, I, I am an IT consultant but I'm also on a school board and a, a not-for-profit board, Camp Quality, um, with a focus on, on the cyber and tech side of things with them as well. Yes, I'm really excited about today, I think we've got a fantastic um, skill set uh, kind of expertise sitting around and I've got to know each of you actually and I got to meet Tracy recently down in Dunedin. So it's neat to have you with us um, and cyber data security and private security. So we're just going to get into it. It can be quite tricky to understand what we need to know as not-for-profits and what we need to think about um, to govern in this space. So today we're going to try and break down some of the lingo. We might pull you up if you kind of go down that pathway a little bit too much. Um, but we just want to demystify the data security, privacy security. But what does it mean? Like, what are, are they both the same? Are they different words? Are they different concepts? Who would like to kick off with data security and privacy, privacy security and how we can... Um, what it means for us and, and our governing roles. Who's going to be uh, brave enough to start? I'll take the take the win for the start, um, Rose. So, look, and I know Tracy's going to give um, a, a much better view of what the privacy principles are around us. But uh, the way to consider data security and privacy is is they are linked, but they're not the same thing. Um, a privacy breach can happen without data security. Uh, a privacy breach will happen if you don't have data security. Let's let's clarify that. But also, you don't need to have a security incident. You don't need to be hacked or um, have have uh, weak technology for a privacy breach to happen. So they are quite separate in that regard, um, and you do need to treat them uh, separately. But also make sure you're treating them the same. Um, I'll talk two uh, two very short sentences on the cybersecurity piece. That's making sure that your cybersecurity is about making sure that your systems uh, and your technology and anywhere you keep data um, is as safe and secure as it can be. So that's your antivirus, your, your network security protocols. It's just having some good things around your computers and, and the computers your people are using to access data that you use. So um, I might throw it as a hospital pass to Tracy to talk on the privacy side now. Thanks, Anthony. I think um, the Privacy Act is, is quite a, a big piece of work and um, it's been beefed up recently. So in 2020, which actually launched in 2021, there are 13 principles of the Privacy Act. And of those principles, the guts of it is, is that we really, now that we have a lot more people engaged on the internet, everybody's on their phones every day, how do we make sure that when people engage that their privacy is maintained. So how do we make sure that personal information stays exactly that personal? 
So there are 13 um, principles and I probably might just run through what they are um, because they do need to be adhered to. So it's a legislation in New Zealand. So the first principle is around the purpose for collection and making sure that you are only collecting that personal information for what it's intended for. You really need to make sure that you only hold it for as long as you're actually using it for and that you don't use it for any other purpose than what you said you were going to collect it for. Um, principle two really focuses on the source of the information. So wherever possible, you want to collect it from the person themselves. So where you have a person... Um, let's just say I was asked to fill in a form. I am the person that is actually the source of the information and nobody else should be giving information on somebody else's behalf unless they're expressly permitted to do so. Um, I think one of the, the other, the third one is about um, what to tell the individual when you're collecting that information. And so that's to make sure that the person understands what their information is being collected for who's going to receive it, whether it's um, compulsory or voluntary that, that they're providing this information and what will happen if the information is not provided. Then there's also the manner of the collection. Is it being collected digitally? Are you aware of it? Is it lawful? Is it being scraped? Is it being stolen? All of those sorts of things need to come into it. But the, the Act says it must be lawful, fair and reasonable. And so people must know that it's happening. Um, the fifth one is around storage and security, and this is what Anthony alluded to earlier. And that, need, that means that we need to make sure that if you are collecting that information, you are responsible for making sure that there are good safeguards in place to prevent the loss, misuse or disclosure of that information. And uh, one of the other new things in the Act now um, is that if an organisation does suffer a serious breach, that it must notify the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, I think it's within 72 hours or as soon as you possibly can. Um, the sixth is about their access to personal information. So that I think Anthony also alluded to this, where you have people inside of an organization who has access to that personal information and is that access appropriate? Um, and seventh is around the correction of personal information. So if I provided information to an organization, I have the right to ring them and check that that information um, is correct. And I have the ability to actually make a case if it's not correct to make sure it's amended. Um, so it does need to be accurate. And also as an organization, you need to ensure that you are using the information that is correct. So you can't knowingly um, put out information that's that's wrong. There's also limitations on retention of information. So there's a lot of things in the Privacy Act that we really need to be aware of. So you can only hold it for as long as you actually need to, need to hold it, i.e. for the purpose in which you collected it. So if you collected it for a customer and for a customer use or for a particular event, at the end of that event, now that that purpose has been is completed, you must actually delete that information. Um, and so you couldn't then use it for something else. So you can't reuse it for a, a different use. Um, you can't disclose that personal information to any other body. So you must keep it confidential. And you certainly can't disclose outside of New Zealand. And there's a good reason for that. And that's you need to ensure if you are sending it to say, your branch overseas, that that branch is also subject to New Zealand Privacy Act laws and that the personal information is still being protected under New Zealand Privacy Act. Um, you can't apply personal or unique identifiers. And an example of that might be if the New Zealand government gave you a number and that was going to be your number for your IRD for every other driver's license or something like that. So you can't apply a unique identifier that may already be in use somewhere else. And that's about it really. The only other advice I would give is we've had a number of breaches and the, all of these principles apply back to why the breaches got so bad or, or got as big as they did. But I've probably talked enough about that. But I would recommend going to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and just having a look at those 13 principles. 
Yeah, thank you, Tracy. And we'll share out the privacy context as well. Um, those are really good questions. I think it's turning the questions into um, how do we apply it in a governing sense? And we're going to explore a little bit about that um, a bit more as we go on in the talk. But when we're talking about overseas, what about the, what kind of global impacts? What does New Zealand, um, what do we do well or not so good in terms of dealing with cybersecurity and privacy? What kind of laws can you see that might impact us that we need to think about that you might see is happening overseas? Um, and kind of bringing this up, we, we've had quite a lot in the news recently around um, fake kind of websites and call centres and people getting scammed. Um, something to be aware of is, is looking at these examples and then kind of what's the risk to whether you might be a membership organisation or association or you're running things online as we everyone is doing nowadays. Like what kind of, what are we seeing that, that potentially can come and impact us uh, that you see is on the horizon? that be Tracy or Chris, have you seen? I'll let one of the boys take that one. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, maybe Chris, if you want to jump in first and um, we can build on it from that as well. Hi, kia ora. I guess we see uh, just talking about the, the website stuff uh, and online scams is becoming very prominent um, uh, in our communities. I think the, the recent one that I get a lot of is the uh, roll, toll, roll toll up the new highway up Puhoi, uh, saying that I haven't paid uh, my, fi uh, my fee on there, yeah. my toll. Uh, it comes via text. Um, so it's identifying and exposure and educating people about these scams and, um, and the ways that they go about it, I think you'll see a lot of people in, in the news and in the media at the moment, um, elderly, senior people who are being asked for information, rung up, uh, asked for personal information to give out over the phone. So there's a real, um, I guess, a misunderstanding, even with our local organisations, telcos, power companies, with the manner in which they do ring up customers and, and request information or want information about their account. Um, even I saw um, a post the other day on LinkedIn, uh, someone who's got a bit of technology, technological nails about them falling for one of these uh, phone scams because he, he thought 100% this is from um, his power company. And I think... The biggest challenge I see for small not-for-profits is understanding all of the layers of complexity that come because, you know, often we we, we can think of it as a, a really big thing, data security, but it could be something as simple as putting all of your contacts into an email in the, the two column. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sharing of the email is um, kind of, sharing of data so i think there's a real balance in there of it doesn't have to be a big hack from outside these could be simple things we do right down to you know big organizations and, and small organizations and what information they're putting on their websites about their staff about their people contact numbers emails etc um you know the service information in the space Lots of uh, websites that are, are pointing to one direction and feeding into a, ri a rhetoric that's happening at the moment. And, you know, great year to do it, election year, uh, with lots of cordial going on. So I think one thing to just kind of bring it back down to our smaller groups is how do we educate them on some of the simple things? You know, I think Tracy stepped through a lot of the... the for the steps that are there, but actually when we look at our boards, it's a lot of mum and dads, you know, who have, have jumped on them school boards. They're, they're just wanting to do the best for that group. Um, but are the resources there to help them with big issues like this around, uh, you know, data protection, privacy, security, data sovereignty? And these are big topics that have quite a, a long reach into many different areas. Pretty gone off track there, so I've chucked the anthem. 
Yeah, and quickly, um, Chris, I do want to, I do, I think data, yeah, sovereignty yeah. is something that um, it's also really keen to explore. But uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's it's totally true. It can be just your data, your email set that is the biggest thing that you hold about someone that you're asked to join. And um, thinking about some of our corporate societies in particular, we might have quite a lot of this information on hand for quite some time. Some of these incorporated societies and membership organisations have been around for several years, many years. So uh, I think we've got a question about that, about holding the, um, how long we hold that for. But back to you, Anthony, did you want to um, chip in about what Chris was saying about overseas? Yeah, probably to add on it, and um, I think this, this, the, the question that's come through from Carolyn would be a good one to jump to if, if we could get Tracy to answer that one as well, because I'm, I'm curious. Um, but overseas, certainly, there, there's there's obviously the, the, the big ticket uh, regulatory changes that we've seen come through, GDPR out of the Europe, um, out of the EU, and then there's one out of America as well, um, Californian something, it's an acronym as well, that those regulations, even though we're not operating in Europe, if we have European citizens in our databases, they apply to us. Um, so it's it's very important for any company and, and even um, community governance and not-for-profit boards need to be considering this as, as who are they collecting data on and also where's that data being held. Um, so it's, it's quite easy to go and uh, drop all the information into a cloud somewhere, Google, Microsoft, um, or, or uh, more specialist tools like Salesforce, um, and, and the like, but but actually understanding where that data is and what it's being used for is key. Uh, there's a headline I saw just in the last couple of weeks, you know, all the noise, all, all the focus has been on chat GPT and the amazing things that can do, um, but the companies are now starting to leverage. Um, Zoom and Google have both uh, publicly announced that they're going to use any data that's stored in there. So for Google, it's anything you put in your Google Docs. For, for um, Zoom, it's any conversations you have and record and keep. Uh, they'll use those to train their own large language models, their own competitors to chat GPT. So it's more, what we're seeing overseas is it's more than just making sure your data is safe. It's also that you understand how what you're signing up to when you sign up to um, cloud providers who, who, for all intents and purposes, will trust Google because there's no reason not to, but they are going to take our data and use it in ways we never anticipated us uh, anticipated them doing. Hmm, we've got some great questions coming in, and um, there's two in particular, but I think, uh, Tracy, if you've managed to see what Carolyn's first question is about um, Geneva and registration required members' details, have you had a look at that question? No, sorry, I can't quite get it up on my screen, but would you mind reading it out, and then I'll have a crack at it. So this is a question for Tracy for the Geneva registration required member details, name, contact details and held on record for five years after someone leaves, then this Privacy Act changes that, correct? Question mark. I would say so, yes, unless it's specifically said on the application form that you are holding it for that period of time, in which case it would be okay because the customer or the person that you're collecting the information on is aware of the length of time. So Really, the Privacy Act is about having the person back in control of their personal information. So if it's set out out front in the application form or whichever means you've collected it by, then that's fine. I've got another really good question from Claire, and thanks, Carolyn, because she's jumped in too. But, um, yeah, this is, this is how we operate. So uh, we've got a question about people using shared emails on boards. Sometimes you see people use their work one, so I'm not sure that's uh, K to five. But anyway, um, basically, you have access to information they are not entitled to. Do you, do you think that if you have a formal role, you need to ensure trustees have their own email and that it's accessed by others in that whānau? I know what I think. What, what do you guys think? I'll give one of the others a, a go at that first. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite common for yeah yeah yep. I'm I'm going to yes is, is the answer and I guess the best example I can get or the two examples I can give um is as to uh why you should consider you know if it is a shared computer not just a shared email address but a shared computer um 
people can be seeing information they, they shouldn't be privy to. Uh, boards do see a lot of sensitive data, and it's not just that about individual layers uh, or individuals. It's it's you know, commercially sensitive data as well, so that that can be stored. Um, I've for the two boards I'm on, the school board. I originally gave them my work email address to communicate with. Now it's my own company. I am the only employee, but what I was told by the school secretary was you can't use that. You need a personal one, um, which is great. The other board that I'm on, all, all the board members have their own um, email address that, that carries the board's domain as well. So everything we do is done under the name of that, that um, not-for-profit. And I think those, those are two good practices to adhere to is, is not using shared email addresses or not using company email addresses for, for board members uh, and, and trying to consolidate as much as you can um, because you, you do run that risk of um, accidental or accidentally leaking information that shouldn't have been leaked. Yeah, it's such a simple thing that we actually really do need to think um about like we've got to be careful who we're representing especially if you're on a couple of boards or your roles and we're juggling our roles and volunteering and sometimes it's a mix we just have to be careful about uh who we're representing and um yeah and it, it is quite easy to set up quite a you know emails for trustees or board members um in separate accounts um, you might have kicked off some conversation about this Google thing, Anthony, because then we've got one from Mike. Does Google then hold us in breach of the act? So, uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that. And, and it's a good one that we can look into because I, 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 I genuinely don't know the answer. Um, uh, it's, it's probably worth the research. And, and Zoom would be the same as well. It's, it's like I say, it's it's been um, making sure that you understand what you're signing up to is, is the most important piece in there. And, and also what data you might be storing in there. Just a couple of practical things as well, by, I guess, having a, a trustee email specific to the trustees, um, thinking of like when you're in Google Workspaces and collaborative docs and what's been shared through there. You know, I guess one of the challenges with small uh, trusts or not-for-profits is you are using personal emails. When that person then moves off the trust, uh, it's then up to your IT support person, which is usually sometimes your CE or or someone on your small trust is, what is the workload is going to take for them to move through all of these um, access um, accessibility issues by when they move out of there? I guess the, the benefit of, let's say, Google Workspaces and when you create a, a Google uh, email for that trustee, for that account, when you move them out of that group, that removes all their privilege access to the, the shared drive and, and drives, et cetera. So if there's one benefit to giving them an email, it's the, I guess, when they exit the organisation, you have the ability to remove all that access rights as well in one in one move rather than oh, which uh, which document has Chris got access to. I need to go through down or through the layers. So I think that's a, just practical things like that. There's, it's one small thing, but it could save a lot of time at the far end when they do move off the board or move off out of the organisation. Yeah, and I think there's some comments about how we communicate as um, board members, and it tends to be some popular sites. So, like WhatsApp is is something that uh, communications um, lack. You know, there's quite a bit of uh, chat and some documentation. It's it's also wondering how secure some of these sites are, and so we do have a question around that around communications and what we're covering. How how safe are these tools that we're using? in the sense of privacy. I think anything you ever put on email, you can always assume that um, it could be looked at at some point in time. So you'd always want to use the best manners that your mum gave you. Um, you'd always want to assume that it's a, of a, you know, you wouldn't mind it being seen. So I think you always have to take care that once you send an email, it's out in the ethernet forever. You can't actually extract it back. So I think people should always take care when sending emails. Um, there was the other point too around having an email account for a specific role, and I think that's the right thing too. Having a shared email account with Farno means that everybody in that Farno has the access to it. So it really comes back down to that access component that we've talked about before as well. But in terms of WhatsApp, 
I know that um, there are some organisations that won't allow WhatsApp apps to be downloaded onto their iPads or phones for the reasons of security. There are some companies, well, you know, there's, there's all sorts of rumours around who has access to those WhatsApp uh, applications. So it's up to the, each organisation as to how strict they want to be around their security protocols for which apps are used. Yeah, there's a bit happening in Australia, wasn't there, around, um, you know, you can't download certain social media platforms. Mm. Probably yeah. name them, but you know, like you, how how do you once you put them onto your phones and communication tools? So, um, yeah. correct. So, and and just to, to echo what Tracy said, you know, WhatsApp is an encrypted app, so it's point to point encrypted, and what that means is is no one's going to be able to intercept a message in flight and see what's there, but it doesn't stop a privacy breach from happening because if you in, accidentally add the wrong person to the message, or you accident, or you you don't remove the wrong person when they leave the organisation, and you start sharing information through WhatsApp, that's when you run into that problem. Uh, the advice I give my clients with with using the tools is the tool's fine. The, the the tool is usually just a channel that gives you what you need. Just understand how you're using it and understand uh, what the rules are that you're putting in place and any security you need and make sure you've got some really good clear policies as well. So you know, WhatsApp's probably not the uh, the channel to be sharing the financial the annual financial reports with the board. Um, but it may be the channel that's, is to tell them that they should log into a secured site to check those reports that they're now available. You know, it's it's just being clear on what you are sharing and what you're not sharing in there. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, so I was just, one of the other things we were thinking about is um, some examples that, would, that you could share with us about things that we should not do. Um or some kind of maybe examples that you've got that you've seen that hasn't worked too well. Uh, it might be a cyber breach or dealing with talked about personal data. But have you got any examples that, about not for profits or organisations that have incurred um, or maybe they've, they've done a little bit of things that they shouldn't have done that we could learn from? Um, I might jump in first, guys. Um, I think. What I've learned a lot about is the, the two massive breaches that have happened in Australia and New Zealand recently. So the first one was back in September of last year where there was the Optus breach. So Optus being the telecommunications company in Australia. So they had 9.8 million customer records which were stolen. And the problem with that was, and the reason there were so many, is that they had never gone through their database and removed customers that were no longer customers. So of those 9.8 million, there was only about 1.5 million of those that were still current customers. So there were a lot of customer records stolen and put onto the dark web that were no longer customers. So if we refer back to the Privacy Act principles and keeping it, the information only for as long as you needed it, that really would have reduced the scale of that breach right down to a much smaller number if they were only keeping the records of those customers that they were actually active customers at the time. And then the, the big one that New Zealand's had, obviously, is the Latitude breach, which was earlier this year. And this is where 14 million records from Australia and New Zealand were stolen. Some of those records were over 18 years old. So if we apply the same principle, there wouldn't been there wouldn't been as many people affected had they gone through and done proper disposal of data. Um, throughout the, the time. Um, there are now 1 million New Zealanders who have had their driver's license details stolen. And so, you know, that, that's quite an inconvenience for those people because they need to go out and buy a new one. So there's the reputational risk that's attached to that. So those are the things you shouldn't do is keep information longer than you need to because all you're doing is really amplifying the size of the breach that you could incur. Yeah. Mm. No, that's um, that's good advice, and yeah, um, people can have a look at those examples too if you haven't already heard about it. But Anthony or Chris, have you got some examples about things that you've seen, or that um, especially you, you know, all three of you work in this space a lot, so you're probably very conscious of um, probably 
are we not actively looking at what we have or we're not reviewing it? I kind of think in the governing space with our agendas and we kind of talked about this about uh, health and safety. It was always the biggest thing on our agendas for quite some time. PCBU it was the biggest change that happened that we had to think about um, and we had to monitor and measure and all these things for our not-for-profits and organisations. But is this the cyber security uh, in the space? Is this something that we need to be putting on our agendas, thinking about being more proactive do you get a sense that we are being active or we're just kind of like, oh, we don't know? What can we do to kind of make some, create the impact, you know, to get it onto our, our agenda or what do you what do you guys think? I might let Chris go first and, and then I'll finish with some thoughts of, of what I've seen as well. Yeah, kia ora. I guess uh, if we look at cybersecurity, the biggest risk is people. Uh, it's not the computer, it's not the Wi-Fi, it's not the hardware that's doing it, it's, it's people. Uh, and it's not that it's um, done on purpose, it's usually done by accident, well not all the time. So I think the biggest thing that I see is making sure that they're educated through some of the free courses, online courses that they've got out there around cybersecurity, just around the awareness, you know, it does, you don't have to be a cybersecurity expert, there's some really good um, courses that are there that just walk you through uh, simple things that you, you take for granted, like your passwords uh, and, you know, how keeping the same password and using it over and over can be uh, dangerous <laughs> for a number of reasons, but also down to, you know, simply sharing files uh, whether online or via USB and some of the elements of that there. Um, you know, right down to what information is online. You know, some of us, some of profit organisations probably work in some really um, dangerous online spaces or, or physical spaces. So what information are you putting on your website about your staff uh, and what personal details are on there as well? So, you know, a couple couple things that I know our organisation is, is going through is a big audit of what's online on our own websites, but also it can carry on what what's available on your own social media sites, what details are you putting there, who you work, or what boards are you on? Um, you know, and in the online harm space and space where there is bad actors working in there, it's an easy way to find people to target them online um, because they can see that person A sits on a board at this trust here and they are doing something that we don't agree with. So you get, it's a level of knowing what you have or your digital footprint or your digital data is available online and, um, you know, it, it's not about understanding all the layers of security that a network holds. It's about simple stuff that your trustees, your boards, the people running the, the organisations can do to make or limit the possibility of um, something happening. Hmm. Thanks, Anthony. And I think to add to that, Chris, all agree with everything you and Tracy have said there. And, and to add to it, the, the three things I'd, I'd say are... Um, don't panic if you do have a cybersecurity event. If, if you do find that you've been hacked or if, if you've lost data through whatever reason, don't panic. Um, there's a joke we make in the industry that there's two types of organisations, those that have been hacked and those that just don't know it yet. Um, so it's it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, yeah, yeah, Anthony, that, that is a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Waikato District Health Board is a pretty high-profile high um, case for New Zealand where they, they, were, they were hacked. Um, at the start of this year, there was a, a, an IT company down in, in Wellington that suffered a ransomware attack, and that knocked their customers out as well, a lot of government customers. Um, and just recently, there was another IT company that, that was hacked, and their customer data was breached. So it happens, and it happens to people who should know better. Um, Chris shared the example before of, of someone falling for um, the, uh, uh, the the power company scam, and it happens. So, so don't try and hide it. Don't panic and don't try and hide it. Um, 
you don't have to broadcast to the world that it's happened, but find someone who can help you and, and bring them in to, to help you um, work through the next steps. Uh, you, just 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 understand that there are obligations that go through. And I saw a question come up about zero and data stored in zero. Um, the simple answer, and, and there's probably a more complex one, but the simple answer is if 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 a company is hacked like zero, they have to tell their customers and then their customers have to tell their customers as well or, or, or people who may be impacted by it. So um, don't just assume that, that hey, it happened to them, it, it doesn't affect me. Um, there are still some obligations on you as well. So I'll, I'll just reiterate it. Don't panic. Don't try to hide it. Um, and don't take too long to ask for help. Uh, there's, there's some great resources on CERT, uh, the, the government website, I think it's cert.gov.nz. Uh, some great resources there about what to do and also a reporting channel. Um, and there's also plenty of uh, IT companies out there who will um, pick up the phone if there's a problem and, and can help you work through it as well. So um, what I'd suggest is find someone that you can call before it happens um, and, and almost have their business card as a break glass in case of emergency kind of um, kind of thing. So that, that's my advice anyway. It's, it's assume it will happen at some point and just be prepared. Maybe I'd, I'd add to that as well and say that the way to not panic is to know exactly what you do in the situation. So maybe having a framework that you discuss um, around the collection, the storage, the protection, and the use and disposal of personal information that, that your company that you're responsible, responsible for might be holding. And then also have a plan for when you do get breached and, you know, not if, just don't consider it as a if, consider it as a when mm -hmm. and what your actions be. And then that will start to inform you and think about what your biggest risks are. I saw a really good question on the chat there. Um, one of the people had asked around holding ministers' details for a very long period of time. I think because you, you do need to ensure that you're asking that person that you can hold that information and for how long you're going to be holding it and for the purpose for which you'll be holding it. The reason that these breaches are so common is because it's been monetized. And so as a crime, you, I think it's the going rate at the moment is between five and seven dollars per person that they are the credentials that they're stealing. And it's used for identity theft and identity identity fraud. So as many times as you've got some data up there about a person, their full name, their date of birth, all those sorts of things, you are providing sufficient information for somebody to um, impersonate them. And it might be to raise credit, it might be to get access to people that they want to influence. But there are a ton of reasons why it happens and it's all available on the dark web and, and all sorts of um, things like that can easily happen. So it has been commoditized. Unfortunately, COVID meant that um, and all the, the borders that have been locked down meant that crime had to shift a little bit as well. And so we did find that a lot of criminals had shifted into the cyberspace um, where it was lucrative and it didn't matter um, what sort of borders were in place. So I would just suggest to have a bit of a framework that you might reference at a board talk and potentially just to have a plan around what would happen if you did get a breach, just because it will reduce that panic because you'll have something sort of set out and ready to go and maybe practice it a couple of times. Yeah, I, that's I, I, great. That's, yeah, that's great. Um, practical advice actually because if you did a role play and it's often it's often good to go through okay it's like emergency management if any, anyone's done civil defense and things you role play worst case scenario you have a plan in place it's actually a good practice so what happens if we someone got all our email addresses and um cross fingers um nothing happens to anybody here but spams it and you know pretends that you're another organization or something like that so then you can work through kind of like what one you you have to let um, certain agencies know, privacy commission, go through who you have um, and protections in place. So that's really practical advice about uh, your board getting together, doing some kind of strategic thinking, worst case scenario, best case, uh, who have we got around the table um, come up with a plan. So a bit of an action plan around it. Um, sounds like great advice. Mm. Maybe just considering what your exposure might be if you were breached. You know, would it be a financial exposure? Would it be uh, reputational? Would it be, you know, all of the things? And that might then help you determine, okay, here's the action we'll take as a result of that. Might 
cut down our last store, we'll store it somewhere else or we'll have only certain people um, have access to that and, and that then starts to reduce your surface attack print or how it's so important, isn't it, Tracy? It's like reputational risk, organisational risk. And also what Chris was saying about protecting staff because mm, if yeah. someone wants to, they can dig right into where you're from or find your address. Thank goodness we've changed some of the charity laws. You don't have to put your address down if you're, you know, you're on the um, board. Um, but, you know, you never know where people are looking for information. They're scanning these kind of platforms. So it is about protecting your staff and your team and your members as well quite a bit. We've got, on the, um, um, yeah, sorry, just on on one thing on the online space. You actually, you, the people that can access you are worldwide. Whereas if you had a piece of paper, the people that can access or you you potentially could have a breach with are those people that are going to come into contact with that piece of paper. But I do often see, you know, someone sign in as you go and they'll have your name and they want your address and everything else. If you can go to write that down and actually see somebody's details above you, the person that's collating that list is actually breaching privacy. So just small things like that you do have to be aware of because if you are able to see somebody else's details, then you've actually breached privacy. I think what I like, like Ross and made a comment about costs for small charities or, you know, not-for-profits, and it is something we have to be mindful of because trying to get great, support and expertise sometimes it can come at a cost and sometimes we don't have time to dig around and find these things um so then you put it into the too hard basket but by saying look put it on your agenda work through what that looks like worst case best case and then maybe who to contact and what you're supposed to do gives you a bit of assurance that you're on the right pathway because uh, we've also got quite a few comments about policy so we've got some some people sharing some good policies, but also equally, if if you uh, if our panel guests have some policies they'd like to share, that would be great for people online. I'd, I'd say just on the policies, because I see there's there's a, a good discourse about data security and uh, cyber security policies and privacy. Uh, one to have alongside, and this is to Tracy's point about um, practice, practice, and be prepared and have a framework. Uh, find or, or, or develop or find or, or get hold of an incident management process that you can follow as well. Um, so the incident management process, you know, in the, in the heat of the moment, it can be hard to remember what to do. The process should very clearly show who's responsible for, for doing certain actions for your company, um, who you might need to call at certain points, um, and what kind of information you've got to give out as well. And, and that can be fed down to, if, if, if you're fortunate enough to have an operational staff underneath the board, that can be fed down to them so that they can, can escalate up as well. So absolutely have an incident management policy that, uh, sorry, process that those policies reference um, as part of them. Yeah, and it's something that might help Helen, who's got a very uh, interesting one with lots of personal information that's being shared and it's coming from overseas. So that might be something for her to say, this is who's responsible for the information and collation of it. But then where does it go? Because she's saying it's coming, they're receiving it by email. Mm. Uh, and how do you store it? So I think um, personal information through recruitment is a really good one. So, you know, we used to often see that you'd get an email in and they'd forward the email, the CV on to the next person and somebody else gets a copy of it and then they take... Um, referee checks for instance all of this is really personal information that should only be kept for the time of the recruitment and if that person didn't actually get the job unless they specifically say I'd like you to hold my details for something else that comes along you actually are obliged to delete it <laughs> and double delete it and make sure that all of those records are, have disappeared so in those instances potentially the best thing to do is to if you are an interview panel for instance there were three of you you'd want to send around a link to the um, cv so that you know that you can actually get rid of that link and not all of the copies that have been um, created by emailing it out and having you know mm. people with that information so you can start to use practices like that like linking a document so that you've got the original document that you can dispose of and know that you've um made sure that that person's privacy remains intact. Yeah. Yeah, it's been yeah, something. 
Yeah, just another practical thing is sometimes when we delete stuff, it just goes to the bin in the email. It doesn't actually get permanently deleted until you go in there and remove it. And that's the same with like the Google Drives of the world that goes into a trash can for 30 days. Just in case it's one of those things you delete it by accident, you can go back and say, uh, just because you've removed it or put it into the bin or put it deleted it from the drive, Google Drive, Share Drive, whatever, there's still a presence of that digital file there. Um, so it might be just something if you are using the likes of Google Workspaces is look at some of the, you know, there's rules that you can do in the, the um, admin console to make sure uh, certain things, how long they stay in there, how long they, when they get permanently deleted and things like that. But back to that policy, isn't it, or process, everyone understanding what the process is. Um, and HR, like Tracy said, is a difficult one because you are receiving quite a lot of sensitive data and information, um, especially when they are sending crap, photographic ID or copies of them anyway. So, yeah, cover that. And, like, and, and to, to add into that, um, uh, from, from a community governance perspective and, and community groups, if you're doing fundraising as an activity, um, be very mindful of, of any financial data you do collect credit cards being a big one um stripe while it comes with a the a cost stripe is a, an example of a good way of collecting donations from from the community because they have very 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 strong protocols around um pci dss which is the payment card industry security standards they are adhering to those and by using them you are you are adhering to theirs as well so um, do explore tools. Definitely don't store credit cards in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet because that's that's where big problems can occur. Um, and also, and this comes back to Tracy's earlier point about only store what you need to. Uh, I've worked with a few not-for-profits now where um, I've sort of increasingly become aware that, that your traditional business has a customer and it's one person and it's, eight, well, you know, it's lots of people, but they have one profile and they fit that profile. Not-for-profits and community groups don't have a single customer. They have... They'll have a, they may have a, a volunteer set, which is a customer. They may have a donor set, which is a customer. And then they may have, um, or they will have whoever's a recipient of their service. So the the, the downstream beneficiaries of, of that governance group, that's also a customer. And the interesting thing is they can all cross over. So one person can fit into all three of those categories, but they're still not the same. And it just comes into be mindful of what you're collecting and how you're storing it and how you're collecting it as well. Because uh, if, if you're throwing... Um, let's say it's a hospice um, data set and if you're taking patient data and trying to link it to, against their family donation history that's quite a big piece of information that you've built about a single family that, that can be very valuable to someone if they were to um, get their hands on it. Yeah that's um, and that's how much you know support and impact our not-for-profits have because we do we do have lots of um, social services and quite um you know, very detailed information and confidential information that we do hold. So this is definitely critical. Uh, we've got our own um, uh, question around, like, videos like this. Like, we have all of our videos up online. Um, yeah, and what we do with video content, like you're saying, is Zoom. So um, even though you put up a recording, kind of um, recording it now, it's, it's what's the purpose of what you're collating and what you're using it for, which is really what Tracy has been sharing with us today. Um, also about one about websites and passwords, something that community governance also had always considered as well. And I think sometimes passwords and getting access can limit people's ability to get onto the resources that you want. So um, there was a question around there as well. I wasn't sure if the question was about shared passwords so that um having a couple of people use the same password to get access to a member only area. Um, IT teams don't like that. Thanks <laughs> for <laughs> sharing, sharing um, credentials. And then the, the controls that they have in place have been disrupted by somebody sharing that, that information. It's a bit like giving away your PIN number. So IT teams don't like that. Definitely, and I'm, I'm going to break protocol a little bit on this one. That if, if you're a small company and you're dealing with a, a, a there's, there's there's plenty of tools out there where they charge a per member license fee to use them, and, and the licenses came up earlier. Um, 
and the way around it is to create a shared email address that people can log into. Um, there's, there's other controls you can get to with that. If, if it's trying to save cost, make sure you've got a password safe where that password is stored and it's not just written down on a piece of paper and passed around. Um, and also make sure you're changing it periodically so that as people leave the organization, they can't get back into it. It's it's one of those inevitable ones. Um, I take a slightly different view on most of the IT um, world on this one is that it's inevitable that we are going to have to share passwords at times. So try and make it in a way that's as safe as possible, um, but don't broadcast that too far either. You know, Only people who need to have access to that password should get it and get in there. Um, if you look at it from the other side, and if it's a, a family member or, or families that, are, that they have access to the portal to get information, you know, and it's only they can see what they've got, and they're using a single email address and a shared password, there's not much you can do about that. Yeah, and potentially just just the the rider to that would be if there is really sensitive in, information in there, maybe in those instances you wouldn't allow that practice to happen. Correct. But if, if the knowing that you're probably more likely to get breached in these circumstances where you're allowed when you know that this is going to be ha going to be happening, just be aware that you have a practice or you you've got a plan for when you get breached. Yeah. Yeah. And, and layer the controls. I mentioned it in, in the chat to a response before. Layer your controls around it. So um, have have a good secure password standards and store them in a password safe, like one password or, or others. Um, and have if if it's available, have multi multi factor authentication running as well. So you've got different layers of control that that, that protect your data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds um, that's great advice. I did. I was hoping that we'd get on to a little bit about the social, cultural kind of um, how that how that can relate to personal data and data sovereignty. But I think we're probably not going to get to that. Um, so it might have to be another uh, board talk later, maybe next year. So that would be really interesting to delve a bit more into. Just before we've had so many awesome kind of questions coming in in really detailed so it's neat that we can actually get some um, advice back out to our community with us today but before we uh, do wrap because we've got about a couple of minutes to go um, is there anything else you'd just like to share any uh, tips or advice with us all things um, data security um, maybe from our organization, we spend a lot of money on protecting the perimeter and making sure that we've got all the right IT, you know, firewalls, all the good MFA, all of those great things. But, you know, history tells us that as much as you might have the most magical and expensive protections in place, it's the people that will allow people to subvert those systems. So having cybersecurity awareness sessions with your people is probably the best um, insurance premium you could ever have because it's your people that form your last guard. And so you want them to be aware of what a phishing email looks like, what malware can do to a system and how they might, how they are that last line of defense. And so having that training in place is really good because I think it's something like 69% of breaches mm -hmm. are built through people. Okay, Chris. I guess my my advice is be kind to each other on your board because I think mm. you know a lot of us are, are volunteering our time and as as one part of our uh, jobs that is usually not often paid but we put a lot of time and effort into this so you know a little investment from a, a board into you know training or support around these simple things and um, yeah. I, I can't sort of promote two-factor authentication as uh, as much as I can because it, I know it's a bit of a pain, but it's one way of preventing the next step from happening. And, um, you know, well, education and exposure, I think, is the big one. You know, you're, you're so focused on often the mahi that you do for your not-for-profit, your trust and, and, and volunteering and things like that, that some of the... Um, time that you put into that can supersede some of these small changes that you can implement but it's just getting guidance and I guess knowing where to look you know uh, CERDNZ is a good place got all the guides there it's got some training stuff there um, so always education eh? I think that's that's the key part and 
There are some fun education out there as well, you know, that you can go on there and it's not all about just reading and, and doing some quizzes. There's some um, interactive stuff. I think Education Arcade's got some running there. Um, so there's lots of different things. So, yeah, just be kind and, and realise that, like we've all seen, mistakes, what did Anthony say? Organisations that have been hacked or, or just don't know they've been hacked yet. Mm. Mm, just what you said, Chris, wasn't it? It comes back to people. So, um, yes. Uh, and Anthony, we're it's, a little it's bit a, over today, but um, some final some, thoughts. Some final words for me. Um, definitely do your homework um, on the tools you are using. Just just understand a little bit more about them, um, how they're used, where the data is being stored uh, and, and what it's being used for and, and, and who, ha who has access to it. You know, do that homework. And if you are bringing in a new tool, um, whether it be a a donor management platform or a volunteer management platform. Again, do that due diligence as well to understand a little bit more. Uh, and, and and don't overthink it is probably the big one. Um, it's it's easy to get caught into a horrible spiral with technology that you'll spend more and more and get safer and safer. But there is a point where um, most organisations reach minimum viable protection, which is they've got enough based on what they've got. And that's where they should be aiming for. And trying to get further and further and further into the security realm is just going to cost more and more. So do your homework and 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 focus on what you've got. Um, and just as a lasting thought um, as well, um, don't just assume you're safe because of, of what your practices you've got are in there. Um, feel free to, to, to test it. There are some security companies out there who will do pro bono um, uh, uh, testing and analysis and penetration testing and see if they can get in and they'll give you a report. Uh, I haven't got those companies off the top of my head, but I can share them with you, um, Rose. Yeah, that would be fabulous. And um, thank you. You guys have just done such a fantastic job today. It's a, quite a tricky topic, um, one that we're still, I think, um, putting there at the forefront of our agendas and our thinking in the space. But um, great to have you with us. I've really enjoyed the conversation and some really fantastic, quite detailed comments coming in from our community as well. Uh, to wrap up board talks, we thank our sponsor and um, community governance Aotearoa team with us today. Uh, and the recording is shared out post event. Um, we will double check all our privacy things. I'll be reaching out to the team here. Um, but they're all online, and uh, our next ones coming up are about um, youth and governance and well being to wrap up the year. So have a fabulous weekend. Uh, Kakiti anon.